Welcome to the Teaching Journeys podcast, hosted by Dave Roberts. Humanity possesses a unique skill, the ability to pass knowledge from one generation uh, to the next. This podcast embraces that ability, offering learning opportunities through conversations with extraordinary guests. Dave aims to leave a positive mark on individuals around the world. So before you dive into today's episode, please share this podcast with your network, including friends, family, and colleagues. And please consider leaving a rating or review. Your support makes all the difference. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Teaching Journeys podcast. I am your host, Dave Roberts, and today I have as my guest, Regina LaFrance, and let me re read Regina's bio. Regina LaFrance has come a long way since leaving her native small village, a place she called home until tragedy struck. Drawn from her direct experience, her semi Autobiographical novel, Shayla, is a depiction of the events that happened when she was violently raped as a young girl by a pedophile priest in her village. Her tell-all book further speaks to the deep-seated wounds and trauma that have followed into her adult life and striving to reinvent herself and find healing. Shayla is LaFrance's sharing and ultimate hope for others who have been molested and suffered from abuse. Passionate in the resolve of this issue, LaFrance has made it her ongoing effort to prevent the unthinkable from happening to more innocent children. She currently resides in North Carolina with her husband, Dan, a retired fire lieutenant. Both are transplants from Boston, where they met. Regina, welcome to the Teaching Journeys podcast. I am very excited to have you here as a guest tonight. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for inviting me. We met through actually a Facebook page. It was podcast guest, and your publicist, Tani, reached out to me and said you'd be interested in being a guest. So your story is very compelling. It's something that needs to be heard. Um, your book is a book that needs to be read, and awareness needs to be created to the whole issue of, of rape and incest, and particularly what it does to it to a child and how it affects them going through adulthood. I'm glad you have, you've had the courage to, mm. to share your story and to want to help others in the process. So to begin, please tell our listeners about the experiences that have shaped your life path and your life passions. So growing up, I had a wonderful childhood. I was a happy child very, very active with my father working out on the farm, and we were an extremely happy family. I have wonderful memories of probably between six and nine years old with my parents. When I was nine years old, I was um, introduced to the choir at the church, and my parents uh, really wanted me to sing in the choir. And um, the priest that was in charge of the group um, began to molest me. And then um, that went on for about a year. And when I was 10 years old, uh, he did the unthinkable, which was a horrible attack on me. That um, was uh, an experience that totally changed who. I was for 50 years because during my teenage years, I disobeyed my parents. I did not want to go to church anymore. I did not want to be part of my family. And for the most part, my parents were very frustrated and wanted me to be a good girl. And, but I just couldn't because I didn't trust anyone. And I was so hurt that I just wanted to leave and never go back. So when I was 18 years old, I moved to the United States. And during my 20s, 30s, and 40s, into my 50s, my life was um, a life of depression, sadness, 
always looking for love, always looking for a new job, always looking for a new relationship. And I never found her. I always looked and no matter where I was, I was always running around looking for that piece of love that I had when I was between six and nine years old from my parents and I never found it. So in 2015, I was working and one of my clients told me that her little girl did not want to go to camp that year. And she told me that she was very upset. She didn't know what to do. And at that moment, I had a flashback of when I cried out loud to my mom not to send me to uh, the choir practice. And on that very night, I called my best friend and I told my best friend my secret for the very first time. When you got your secret out in the open, when you talked about what happened to you, when you talked about being violated, being raped, how did that feel to just to be able to get that out to somebody that you, that you trusted? At first, I told her that it was a little girl that I knew on the island. And I told her that the little girl that had suffered so much in the island, I thought she was dead. And, but I realized all those years later that she was not dead and I didn't want to tell her that it was me. So, um, she kind of knew, but she didn't ask a lot of questions. She just told me to tell her about the little girl. And I started talking to her about her because I had, I had just buried her inside for so many years. I didn't want to think about her, <clears throat> excuse me because I didn't want her to hurt. So I considered her to be gone and I became whoever I was during all those years, um, someone that I didn't know even how to identify. So after my girlfriend asking me, who was this little girl and where was she? Then finally we talked for a long time and it wasn't just one day or two we met almost every week and we would talk about her as if she didn't have a name and she wanted to know who is she. And that's when I started writing about Shayla. This was in 2015, mm -hmm. but then I put it away because I didn't want, I didn't know how to write a book. So I, I, in 2015, I wrote maybe 10,000 words and I just put it away. But my friend and I always talked about it. And I told her that I never knew love um, since the age of nine. I wanted to go back to a place where I felt that love from my mom and my dad that I remembered that I loved so much. And she began to teach me that. She's the first person that I really trusted since um, being a, a child. And she's now in her late 70s. and. She is still my hero. And uh, once I began learning about love and self-respect, I was at a um, family reunion with different friends after I moved to North Carolina. And a lady that was there that I didn't know, I asked her what she did for a living. And she told me that she was a book editor. And I said, oh, maybe you can edit my book someday. And she said, oh, you wrote a book? And said, I have about 10,000 words written. She said, I'll be over tomorrow. I had a very old laptop with, with a little disc mm -hmm. that you get the information from. So we had to fire up the laptop and get the information from that disc. And she read what I wrote and she pointed her finger at me and she said, you got to start today. And that was about two and a half years ago. I sat down and I wrote everything that I could remember. And then um, when Tani came on board with me, we went over chapter by chapter to ensure that everything was formatted correctly, to make sure that everything flowed correctly in the way we want it. And um, 
the book was ready. She just helped me organize it. And now we're about, I would say, a week, two weeks out, and we're ready to launch. And I would like to make my mission two things. My mission, one, I'd like to create awareness to people in charge of raising children. If a child cries out that they don't want to go somewhere, we need to pay attention. Why? Because it is my personal belief and experience that a child doesn't know how to verbally communicate. So they will always give us signs of being in distress. And depending on the age of the child, Regina, children aren't capable of making up elaborate lies at, at seven, eight, nine years right. old. They're not capable of doing that. What comes out of their mouth is typically pure truth. When you have to worry about a little bit of the deceitfulness is when they get into the teenage years, which is predictable because they want their independence. And at the same time, they're also, they may keep some secrets from their parents to, to allow them that kind of autonomy, but children don't lie. And I think we also have to cue into behaviorally what's going on with that child. And the, That's right. And because if there's changes in their behavior, like if they're, they've exhibited things that they had not previously exhibited before, like if they were irritable, um, if they were withdrawn, and they didn't have any prior history of that, something's going on. And that's something as parents, as educators, as therapists, we need to be tuned into and we need to be, be aware of. That's right. And the other thing is, is to believe them when they're saying something is wrong. And, and I know this kind of segues into the next question, or one of the next things, again, is that my understanding is that your parents didn't listen to you when you didn't want to take any more music lessons from the priest who had, he would rape you. And, you. and they didn't listen, and they made you go back anyway. Um, how did it feel, one, not to be listened? And secondly, what kind of conflicts did that cause with you in terms of your perception of authority figures, your perception of who you could trust, who you couldn't trust, how did that all factor in just from not being believed? Right. So I did tell my mother many times that I didn't want to go to music lessons. And because I always wanted to be outside and playing, that's why my relationship with my father was so strong, because I was always out farming with him. And she believed that I'd rather be outside playing than to go um, to the choir and the music lesson. And she really wanted me to learn how to play an instrument. And she told me how proud my dad would be to see me play an instrument. Mm -hmm. And I, many times I didn't go to the music lessons. I would hide in the woods. One time I hid in the woods for a long time and I fell asleep. And the priest came to the house looking for me because I didn't show up to the music lesson. And my father insisted I tell him where I was. And I didn't ever tell him because the priest had told me many times that I had to be a good girl and that I could never tell my father because he wouldn't believe me. So that night, my father gave up asking. And that was the beginning of when my father, I hate to say it, but kind of turned his back on me. There was nothing he could he could do because I was not his little girl anymore. I was not his good girl anymore. He had a, a nickname for me, which was Ladybug, because I was very small and my skin is dark, especially mm -hmm. in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And he always said I was as cute as a Ladybug. And I was no longer his Ladybug once those things started to happen. And he was very, very upset. So during my teenage years, my father and I did not have a relationship at all. And when he um, became older and I was already living in the States, I went home to visit him that he was, um, he has taken ill and he was sick. And when I arrived, I kissed him on the forehead and he didn't acknowledge me being there. And that was it. I never had a relationship with my father from the time I was 10 all the way through the rest of his life. So that was, 
another associated loss as yes. a result of the rape is the loss of the relationship yes. with your father, also the loss of your childhood. <laughs> I can't imagine you had a normal childhood, you know, yes. after that. If that had happened to me, I'd want to be invisible. I'd want to be invisible to the abuse. I just, I just would just want to be invisible to everybody and anybody who was, was a part of my life at that particular point. My abuser, you know, my family, and you must have felt like a, alone, totally alone in a group in a group of people. You must yes. have felt alone even within that whole family structure. Yes, in my book, I in order to accept it all so I can put closure to that part of my life, I write a spiritual letter to my father. And that spiritual letter, I tell him that um, after so many years, I have become the person that he knew between the age of six and nine. And I said, um, just so you know, I did not become the teenage daughter that you wanted me to be, but this is why. I'm here to confess to you all the things that happened. And I tell him everything in that letter that happened with the priest that he adored and respected so much. And then at the end of that letter, I tell my father, until we meet again, know that I am now respected by many, loved by many, and I am still your ladybug, the one that loves to plant flowers and and be out in the farm. I am that now that I am aware of my behaviors due to my trauma, I am back to being that child, that that I that person that I was intended to be, one that loved gardening, one that loved nature, one that loved hiking. Uh, my sister would be inside the house playing with dolls and I'd be climbing a tree. So I always liked being outside. That's why he was so special to me. So in that letter, I, I, I did it because it helped me put closure hmm. to not having had a relationship with him. It also sounds in many ways too, is it was almost, can I assume it was almost an act of forgiveness as well too, when you wrote that letter, not only forgiveness, maybe to him, but maybe for you too. On that letter, I asked him to forgive me for having been, and I was never really a bad teenager. I never did anything illegal or anything. I just was rebellious. I stayed out late, didn't obey the, the house rules, that kind of stuff. It wasn't anything that I did that it was illegal or very, very bad, but, but it wasn't. I was no longer his, his good girl that he loved so much. I was his sunshine. And after all that happened, I didn't know how to be anything else but running around. It was easier to be that way for me, not to trust. Well, to, and to keep on moving and, and you, know, you say acting out, being rebellious is a, you, typically a response to trauma. Um, yes. My daughter, Janine, was 10 years old when, when my mother transitioned. And about two or three years later, she began to act out, and we were wondering why. It, and it turns out, turned out that she was still grieving the loss of my mother, but her grief came out differently because she had grown developmentally. She had grown into another developmental stage. And, and that's, I, I guess, one of the things I wanted to ask you with the, the events that occurred with you being raped at nine years old, what I imagine that replayed itself in different ways as you grew developmentally. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how that manifested through, your, through, through later childhood, through um, early adulthood and beyond, and what type of effect that had on, on everything, your relationships, your ability to be intimate, anything that you care to address within all of that that I just, I just mentioned, feel free to go for it. So the rape didn't happen until I was 10. So what he did was he molested me for a whole year. And then um, the rape happened at 10 years old. And after that, 
I never saw him again and I never went near him again um, after what he did because he crossed the line real bad. And um, I I have sometimes thoughts of I probably did just about died that night. And he he probably knew better than to do such thing again. I don't know, but I was um, very, very hurt. And then being a teenager, I thought that the only way that you would find love would be if you were with with a man. That's mm-hmm. all I knew. You That's the only way you found love. But then you find that man that truly loves you, but you don't believe him. So you cannot be intimate. You can never really give yourself to anyone because you're looking for love, but you don't love yourself inside. And then when it happens and you meet someone who's a wonderful man, then you can't be intimate with him because you think that's all you want. Exactly. So you never win. Yeah, I think one of the things that I understood about individuals who were raped, who were sexually abused, is that behavior would come out in terms of sexualization towards towards other men, towards other partners, because that's that's how they felt they were they were valued at that point. At nine years right. old, you get the value. Well, you know, <laughs> if, you know, I'm going to be loved maybe if I, you know, through through sexual means only. And then when you get somebody who treats you with respect to to once they have a relationship with you, you question it because that's not something you've ever experienced before. And in terms of individuals that I've worked with with substance use issues, if they got into a relationship that were individuals were just willing to accept them for who they are, to love them unconditionally, to want to build a relationship that was based on mutual respect and trust, they find a way to sabotage it because it it isn't something that's real that's, to them or something that they they're used to having. So they think, you know, the the, the other shoe is going to drop anyway. This person is just going to want something from me. Let me end it now, or let me jump into the next relationship um, before this one has has a chance to disintegrate on its own. That's right. And uh, for me, I have this thing that I call it running red lights, leaving accidents behind. The second I didn't like something or the second someone said something that caused the trigger, I would just leave. I wouldn't stick around. And you are correct. You sabotage because you not you don't feel worth of the love of anyone. And that's the other thing that I want to make my mission And going forward, not only create awareness to parents to keep children safe, safe, but to also speak with victims that are still there. They're still in that place of pain. And I'd like to, um, for me, how it worked. I went into my inner child and I rescued that child that was still in pain. And once I did that, and I understood that it was not my fault. Then I could go ahead and create that love for me, for, for that child. I could, the, the purpose is to achieve emotional freedom. And I always believe that a recovering, I'm a recovering victim, mm-hmm. not a recovered victim Mm -hmm. because we can have a trigger and then we could fall right back to that place of pain and that place of oh here we go again um so we have to what i want to do is create awareness to victims and help victims see it as a recovering not just one day you're healed it doesn't happen like that And for me, I have learned to recognize triggers and my marriage has increased in a positive way so much better because now I'm able to communicate. And if there's anything that is a trigger, we don't talk about triggers every day, but if if it happens here and there, I recognize it. And then I have the talk to myself and I say, it's not 
it's just the situation. Everyone has those situations. Some people get really upset because it reminds them of things that are painful. And that's what I want to do is speak. I, I, well, I hope my book helps victims realize that they can learn how to identify a trigger. Well, first accept that they were a victim. Then identify the triggers that continuously show up because they're going to show up forever. What specifically is the type of work that you want to do with victims of sexual exploitation, sexual abuse, rape, um, and their families? What are the, spe the specific elements of the message that you want to impart to help them transcend tragedy and re-engage in life with purpose and meaning? What I do is, and, and this works for me, it has worked for me, and I hope that by someone hearing me and um, doing the same can help them. First, you have to create a bubble for yourself and not be involved with people that are toxic and negative, especially, and it's very difficult because a lot of times it's family. It could be your cousins or your parents or your mm -hmm. you know, people that you see every day, or you see all the time. So when it's family, it's very difficult. So if you cannot remove those people that are negative in your life, then you have to go inside of you and start nurturing yourself. And when they speak, whoever those people are, if they the ones that hurt you in the beginning or the ones that didn't um, believe you or the people that are negative around you, you have to find a way to protect yourself and create boundaries for yourself and read positive quotes. I read my positive affirmations every single day. And when I have so many and I have notebooks that I like, sometimes this one says, be the sunshine. And I, um, I just write in, if I see a quote on Instagram or anything, it could be anything, um, be the light or be the sunshine or um, you don't have to respond to all the comments that someone might make that could be negative. Or if you're in a marriage that the other person is negative, it's very difficult to be in that constant negativity every day. You don't have to engage. Eventually, I promise you, eventually you will win because love is very, very strong. So when you learn to nurture yourself from within, you're going to be okay. And that's what I want to teach. But we have to look in the mirror and we have to have that talk with self. I love the affirmation piece. I love the journaling yeah. piece. But I also yeah. like the fact that you emphasize showing grace to your inner child, to yes. that 9 or 10-year-old who had no control over over what happened, could not have prevented what happened. Yes, goes through life blaming themselves and buying into messages that they should have done something to prevent it, that it was somehow their fault that it happened. Um, and for me, it's, you know, nine or 10 years old, you can't fend off somebody who's an adult, who's that powerful, who has, who has status. And at nine or 10 years old, you learn that to respect authority. You learn That's right. that in some way, even though what was, you look, well, he, maybe he did it because he loved me. But then when you get older, you realize that, no, the whole thing wasn't about love. It was about power. It was about exploitation. And it was about victimization. And I think the more that we can help the individuals who are victims empower themselves to take charge of their lives and, and to show grace to themselves, the more likely they're going to be able to transcend what happened. I'm glad that that this is what what you are you are attempting to do. And it's also about helping individuals achieve emotional freedom, which 
I think is, is probably a part of your, a big part of your book with Shayla is how she got to emotional freedom after all the, the abuse and the years of dealing with the consequences of it. Yes. And so if you go to my website, which I will spell lafrancemedia.com and lafrance is LA and then the word France, like the country. So lafrancemedia.com and my website. You will click on the video, the YouTube video that we made for the book trailer. Mm -hmm. And that video, it's seven minutes. It's me suffering, crying, wondering how am I going to feel better speaking with a therapist. And then I go to that place of pain where my inner child was still holding a wooden box in a cemetery, digging a grave. I tap into that piece of me and I run through the woods to save that child. And she was still there. She was still there holding that box. And I grabbed her and I ran away with her. And then it shows towards the end us coming out of the woods celebrating the emotional freedom. It was a very um, emotional, um, sad film to make because we actually went to a cemetery and we actually took a girl that, believe it or not, looked so much like me at the age and we dressed alike and we are in the same girl where the two girls mm -hmm. where I actually go there where she's hurting still holding that box and when I did that I immediately melted in her arms and she melted in mine and we ran out of there and we left the priest behind and when we ran out of there we came out of the woods celebrating emotional freedom and then at the end of that video, I tell the therapist, and that's my story. That'll be a powerful seven minutes for anybody who chooses to watch that. And yes, um, your website will be in the program notes for the audio. And obviously, when this launches on YouTube, it'll be captioned. So you know, the yes. viewers and the listeners will be able to 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 get it i'll make sure that's prominently featured certainly yes in the program and if they just and if they just want to see the video on youtube it's shayla book trailer okay and i'll put um go ahead no i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you go ahead that's it i was gonna say it's just shayla book trailer on youtube but if you go to the website you can actually read more about what really happened and a lot of people don't know why a little girl is in the cemetery holding a little box. And the attack and the rape was one thing. But to go through having to do that in the cemetery with the little box and the shovel and, and all that is something that I will never forget. In my book, I also wrote a letter to the priest, a very short one. And I tell him that I'm releasing him from renting any space in my mind. He is no longer a burden to me. I accept it. What he has done for me, not for him. And the scar that I have on my face from falling on that shovel at 10 years old in a cemetery is a reminder that he was a very bad man. Yeah, the scars that we carry internally and externally are also a reminder of you know, the challenges we had to transcend in our innate will to survive. And I think that's something that can't be underestimated, is our innate will to survive. And um, I mean, it's just great that you are able, that you've transcended your challenges and are now re-engaging in a life with purpose. And you have a mission yeah. and... I hope that you get the word out to every victim of sexual abuse. Um, it's it's powerful. And they're going to realize they're not alone um, in their pain. And a lot of times 
regardless of the type of tragedy we're talking about, individuals hesitate to reach out because of this belief that they're alone. And then when they do reach out, they realize that other people do understand because they've gone through the same thing. And community is also very key, I think, in transcending any challenge. That's right. So, um, just in terms of writing Shayla, you said this process started in 2015, am I correct? In 2015, when I had the flashback, the flashback. I began to write it, and I didn't know how to write a book. I didn't see myself as an author of any kind. So I wrote about, I think, 10,000 words. And then it wasn't until about two and a half years ago that I jokingly told my friend now, my friend Rhonda, um, maybe you can edit my book someday. Yep. And she said, let's, let's find out what you have in this old laptop. And when she read what I had written, she told me to start, start writing. And then when I started writing, it all came out. And here we are. This is going to sound like I'm asking an obvious question, but how emotional of a process was for you to revisit your, the abuse at 10 years old, the rape at 10 years old, and, and write about the progression that you went through from childhood to adulthood? When I sit down um, in this very room here at my house, sit down to write, it was just like the floodgates just opened. I would just type and it would just, just water would just come down, water, water, water it would just come, come down and I just keep writing it. But then I would feel better. And when I um, was done writing everything and the emotional peace, the freedom at the end was so worth it because I went on a hunt for answers. I was looking for love. And I had a husband who loved me and I loved him, but that wasn't enough because there was always something missing. And what was missing was the love that I needed to have for myself. And once I discovered how much love is inside of me to give and, and to receive, I was so excited. I was so excited that I I could just now teach other people to do the same. And and that excites me. I, I want to talk to people that are still hurting inside. We have no choice but to accept what happened because we can't go back and change it. We have to accept it. And once you do that and you start loving that little girl. I took, I have a picture of myself when I was young, a black and white picture, and I put that on my desk and I said, I'm doing this for her. I want justice for her, for the ladybug, the little girl that never had a chance of the way that I loved the animals and the way that I loved cultivating vegetables and planting flowers and being outside. And I am, I could have been a veterinarian I could have been an engineer. I could have been so many different things that my dad would be so proud. But yet I missed out on knowing who I was going to be all through those years. But in order for me to feel better about my life today, I had to accept it and, and release that priest from my life. He doesn't mean anything to me now. Nothing. I think about him as just a person that was a bad person. He does not rent any space in my mind. I don't need him. And he is not a burden to me now because I love who I am now like I did when I was little. And I would imagine that type of release is a key to self-love. If you can release yes. the the pain, the anger, um, or just having the, the, your the perpetrator of the abuse runs space in your head. If you can just let that go, that empowers you and gives you that emotional freedom to be the co-creator of the life that you want in conjunction with the universe. It's that's right. That's another piece I think for me of the emotional freedom that you've talked about on this podcast. 
Yes. And and um, towards the end of my book, I evaluate my life through my teenage years, my 20s, my 30s. And why was I so unhappy? Why was I running around so much? I had so many jobs, different relationships, different places to live. Why was there always, and the common denominator was always me. And I said, aha, I know why I lived a life of chaos for 50 years because I didn't know who I was. And then once I started learning about self-nurturing and learning to set boundaries, learning to communicate, learning to not be so offended all the time with everything. And I started feeling happy. And when I looked in the mirror, I told myself that I was going to be okay. And I want to teach other people to do the same. They may have even more difficult situations than I did. They may have even more difficult things that happen to them. Trauma is trauma. Mm. If we were hurt when we were little, we have problems. Trust issues, mm. depression. Some of us are lucky that we're still alive mm -hmm. because it's just you are always looking for something to fill that void. And it's not until you look in the mirror and then you go in and you get that little girl and you nurture her and you go back. One of my friends said to me, you're lucky that you had from six to nine years old with your father and your, your mother. I never had that. I don't have a little girl to save. I don't even know who she is. And that's true. That's a totally different set of um, issues. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have those years and those memories. And I guess I am very lucky. I thought all children had a childhood, at least like mine. Some children or some women or men my age now never even had that. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning that some people went from foster parent to foster parent to foster parent and up in jail, which I actually worked in three different jails in my lifetime. I met some of them people. So. They say, oh, it's good for you. You have a really good life. You're able to achieve emotional freedom. How am I supposed to even get there? And that's, I am not a trained professional to, to help okay. people like that. But it's just so much pain and, and so much trauma that people suffer. How can we help them all? We, we can't, unfortunately, and, and individuals have to take some responsibility for also right. wanting to help themselves. That's and, right. And that's, it's a two-way street. I, I teach at a Utica University in, in Utica, New York. And I tell my students that you can't take more responsibility for somebody than they're willing to take. It's relationships that's are 50-50. Right. And in the best therapeutic relationships, the more responsibility that person takes, the less of a 50-50 proposition it becomes. You just you are just there to kind of steer the ship to make sure that they're they're focused on their goals and that they're not straying. Both that's parties right. have to be willing to invest for it to be successful. And that's right. And as adults now, we do have to look in the mirror and say, we're adults now. Mm -hmm. We can make decisions. You can make a decision to continue to hurt and live a life of sabotaging yourself like I do. Or you can look in the mirror and say, if that person said I'm beautiful, I'm probably beautiful and stop believing that you have it inside. You just have to see it and feel it. Mm -hmm. And once you begin, and then once you begin doing the work, you have to continue because this is not an overnight result. I've been working on positive thinking for about 20 years now, but it wasn't until I wrote my book that I was able to find the little girl and nurture her. But the positive thinking is a must. Yeah. The longer we live and the, the, the day we stop evolving or growing, 
is the uh, the day that we need to take a look in the mirror and say, why is it that I choose to stop learning about myself and my relationship to the world around me? And the uh, learning doesn't stop. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. So, Regina, give us one or two takeaways from your life experience, teachings that can help others who are listening or, or viewing this podcast. I have two takeaways that I'd like to um, give you. Okay. One is children. Watch for signs of the threat. Children love to go places. That's why we have to watch them so they don't go away with a stranger. A stranger will have a candy bar and a child will just go to go play. So we ha they're very genuine and, and they just want to go places and play. If they tell you that they don't want to go somewhere, their abuser might be telling them, do not tell anybody or I'll hurt you, or I'll hurt your mom, or your mother will leave you or something. So watch out for signs of children in distress. Children love to laugh and play, and they love to talk. Mm -hmm. If they're not telling you something, we need to pay attention. And the other thing is recognize triggers. It is not your fault. It's never a child's fault. And if you're an adult and you suffer trauma, even as an adult, a bad marriage or a bad, a bad relationship or, a, I don't know, a, a sickness or something, it is not your fault. You need to recognize the triggers and then identify them, why you have them, and you don't always need to respond to somebody that is mean to you or rude to you. Mm -hmm. And I would like to just leave the viewers with these two things. Recognize children in distress and know that if you're my age or younger or older and you had trauma, it wasn't your fault. And you can start there. And then once you realize that it wasn't your fault, you can accept because you cannot change the past. You can only change what you can do for yourself tomorrow. And I think you, you hit on a, two very important points. And the one that I want to respond to almost immediately is the part where individuals as adults need that to, not to blame themselves as a child for what happened because parents need to recognize magical thinking in children. Sometimes they think if they said or do something and something occurs as a res bad occurs as a result of that, they had something to do with it. Like if you look at a, 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 you know, a child yells at a dog, for example, the dog gets out of the backyard, the gate's loose, they get hit by a car, automatically a child might think, think well, because I yelled at the dog, the dog ran out of the gate got hit by a car, and it's my fault. And what we need to be able to tell a child, look, it was just an accident. There was nothing you did to cause that. If you were abused as a child, there was nothing that you, you could have done to prevent that. It was not your fault. You were a victim of somebody who was more powerful, uh, who was more maybe uh, esteemed or in his community, and you could not have, have prevented that. And it's time to show grace to yourself and That's forgiveness right. to yourself. Um, That's right. And love to yourself. And oh. we were all born with love, so we shouldn't have to earn it, Regina. You know? Um, That's right. Thank you for those valuable takeaways. And my last question for you, I was going to give you an opportunity to promote yourself a little bit, talk about the book. People want to get in touch with you about what you have going on. They want to find out more purchasing information about the book, Shayla. Um, where can, how can they do that? What's the best way to, to accomplish those goals? LaFranceMedia.com. L.A., France like the country, media.com. You can read everything about what we're doing, where we're going, watch the, the movie, I mean the book trailer, order books um, very, very soon. We're talking as soon as right after Christmas. We are just finishing up the very, very last few details, and then it's going to be available. And um, also, I have a, pub a public Facebook page 
called uh, Shayla. Look at added on their pages. Um, also Instagram, Shayla the book. But LaFranceMedia.com is where you can find me. And then you can uh, reach out to my publicist, Tani Sozana in uh, L.A. And she will um, direct you where you need to go to uh, book me or, or interview me or whatever it is that you might be looking for. And if there's anything I can do to help a small group, a large group, or if I can be of an inspiration to anyone, that is my mission. That is what I want to do. I want to sit across from other people that know pain, and I want to tell them, I am you. Thank you, Regina. And I'll make sure all of that, your contact information, gets in the program notes for the podcast. It has been an absolute pleasure talking with you this evening. Um, I wish you well in your, your travels. I wish you well with, the, um, with the, the book launch. And please, when the book is published, have, have Tani send me, um, uh, send me a uh, link. I'll post it on my social media pages. And I'll look to get a copy for myself. So, um, absolutely. So, thank you again. Um, and with that, that is a wrap on another episode of the Teaching Journeys podcast. I am your host, Dave Roberts, wishing you peace. <laughs>